All right, let's pray and we'll dig into the Word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word. We ask again that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. Lord, give us ears to hear what your Spirit would say to each and every one of our hearts. Lord, I do pray for those in the midst of trials now. And if we're not in trials now, we know they're coming. And Lord, help us to have the proper perspective on this life. Have a proper perspective on the temporary and the trials we go through. Lord, how you use them for your kingdom and for your glory. Lord, help us to count it all joy in the midst of our various trials, Lord, and to honor you. And we thank you for the example we see in this morning's text of the Apostle Paul, who could have been complaining and murmuring and angry and instead was looking for opportunities to point people to you. Lord, may we have that same heart. We ask these things in your holy and your precious name. We pray and all God's people said, Amen. 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 All right, Acts 25. I'll get to the outline in a moment. But before I do, you know, the model for the church today is not the latest church growth book. Can we say amen to that? It's not, it's not to be a purpose-driven or a, you know, whatever-driven or whatever-enlightened or whatever growth movement. And I get them all the time as a pastor. Here's a way to pack out the pews. Here's a way to get people to give you a bunch of money. And what a bunch of nonsense. The reality is that God's called us to make disciples. Amen? And the model for the church is the book of Acts. And it continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the breaking of bread, fellowship, and prayer. That's the church. And as we look at the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, but also the Acts of the Holy Spirit, we see the example for the life that we are to live. It's the example for us. It's not modeled after corporate America. It's modeled after the first century church. Can we all say amen to that? And that doesn't change. There's no new method. There's no new model. God hasn't given us a revision to how he wants the church to operate. The church isn't a building. It's not even a, it's not even a, it's, the, it's us. We're the church. Amen? And so we've seen so far how God has raised up these men and women at, uh, who are not the people that most people would choose. He didn't pick, in, certainly in the first half of the book of Acts, he didn't pick the most educated people to be his apostles typically. He picked the guys that no one else would pick. And he takes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And the first 12 chapters were really focused largely on the life of Peter. And now since chapter 13 on, we've been looking a lot at the Apostle Paul. As we know, Paul was an enemy of the church. He was religious and lost. He was zealous for an incomplete truth. He was waiting for the Messiah, though the Messiah had come. He had a head-on collision with Jesus Christ. He began to minister to the known world. He was planting churches everywhere he went. He caused revival or riot wherever he stepped into, into a city, and often both, because he could not and would not change the topic. He would not change the subject, and you couldn't change his mind, and we would call that a fanatic today, and praise God for people that are fanatics for Jesus Christ. Amen? As my mom used to say, who do you want to be a freak for? I'm a Jesus freak, and I would say amen to that. And so... As we come to these latter, late last few chapters, Paul was on his way to Jerusalem, as we know. He was warned not to go by people that loved him, even by a prophet, Agabus, who, who took a belt and said, whoever this belt belongs to, he tied himself up. This is going to happen to him. And Paul's response was, none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself. It wasn't about his comfort. It was about God's glory. And you know what? We can, it's easy to say that, and it's another thing to do that. Can we say amen to that? Well, I don't want to do that. It's uncomfortable. I don't want to step out of my comfort zone. I don't want to do things that are going to cause me to, to have to be stretched or rest in the Lord or trust in God. And we'll say that we want to live sold out for the Lord and then someone will be right next to us. We have an opportunity to share our faith and we're afraid to do it because we don't want to be uncomfortable. And so the Apostle Paul, we've been learning from the example as he's filled with the same Holy Spirit that we are. As he gets to Jerusalem, and sure enough, when he got there, God had allowed him to minister to the Gentiles, but he still had a burden for his people. He still had a burden for the Jewish people because he was a religious leader of the Jews, and now here he is, a, an on-fire Christian, and he goes to the Jewish people, and they receive him not. When he gets there, we know that they began to beat him. They took him outside the city gates. Uh, you know, he's bloodied and battered, and every, even as blood, he's bloodied and battered, being carried away to the barracks, he sees this crowd, and he asks for an opportunity to preach to them. He saw everything that he went through as an opportunity for the gospel. Now, in the last few chapters, he's had more and more audiences with the Sanhedrin, and now he's been sent down to Caesarea. We talked about this last week. If you were here last week uh, in Acts 24, I titled the message, No Decision is a Decision. And everybody makes a decision about the gospel. Everybody. You either accept it or re you reject it. Can we say amen to that? You've either surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you're either a friend of God or an enemy of God. There's nothing in between. And just because you're friends of friends of God doesn't make you a friend of God. Amen? 
You know, just because your parents are friends of God doesn't make you a friend of God. At some point, every one of us has to make their own decision about their relationship with Jesus Christ. We saw last week that there was a man who wanted to put off his decision. My burden in my heart for everyone in this room right now, anybody watching on live stream or listening on the radio later, that today is the day of salvation, amen? And no decision is a decision. And don't put off your decision about your relationship with the Lord. So as we come to chapter 25, he's been taken away to Caesarea, some 65 miles away. We saw last week that he stood before Felix, and I called him Felix the rat as opposed to Felix the cat, right? And we saw him stand before him, and Felix did not make a decision about him. He puts him under house arrest, and then he ends up being there for two years under house arrest, with no charges against him. Now, I don't know about you, but maybe some complaining would be a normal thing. Why am I here? Why are you chaining me up? Why, do, why have you bound me here? I've done nothing wrong. You've made no charges against me. This isn't fair. Somebody call an attorney. And you know what? Paul doesn't do any of that. Paul trusts in the sovereignty of God. He takes the Guys, he's chained to as an opportunity to share his faith, and he knows there's greater opportunities coming. So grab your outline for this week in Acts 25, and I tile the message, Count It All Joy. Let me ask you a question. How many guys are in the midst of some kind of a trial right now? Raise your hand. It's m most of the room. And if you're not in a trial now, there's one coming. Amen when you fall, not if you fall into various trials. And sometimes it's, our Ill, it's an illness, it's our finances. It could be a difficult boss or coworker, your neighbors. It could be family struggles. It could be kids that are wayward and you know, prodigal children that you have. Uh, it could be desire to be married or to have children. It could be uh, a death in the family. And all these things that go on in our lives, these trials and these difficulties, the reality is that the enemy wants us sometimes to think that God's punishing us. And my heart for all of us is that we, we would not confuse uh, div divine appointments with divine judgment. Can we say amen to that? Sometimes we think that, well, you know, if God really loved me, he wouldn't let me go through difficulty. I don't, show me a verse for that. That is a false gospel. Amen? The whole prosperity doctrine. If you just believe and, and beg, tell God what you want, He'll give you, and you'll be on a cruise ship to heaven. You'll never have another trial. Show me somebody in the Bible that was used mildly that didn't suffer greatly. There aren't any. Can we say amen to that? Well, I don't want to say amen to that because I don't like that. <laughs> but the reality is that we're going to go through difficulties and trials because, you know, it is but light affliction compared to the glory that can be revealed in us if we will just trust and honor God. Can we say amen? So, that's where we're going to see the continuation of, of Paul continuing to be falsely accused, to be put on trial for no reason, to not get his, quote, day in court. But you know what Paul does? He just keeps looking for opportunities to point people to Jesus. Can I pray for all of us and ask that we would pray ourselves that when we're in the midst of the trial, try to look at it through the Lord's eyes. Amen? Try to say, Lord, it's not... Why did you allow this? But what do you want to do in me and through me while I'm here? Lord, how are you going to use this for your kingdom and for your glory? It's not a, God doesn't care, doesn't care about my comfort, but he cares more about my character. Amen? And Lord, mold it. So count it all joy. Learning to see trials not as God forsaking us, but as an opportunity for the gospel and to grow spiritually. First, Lord, help us to stand even as our trials endure. Have you ever been in a trial and you just feel like God forgot about you because it just keeps going? Can we say amen to that? Oh, but I've been praying. Pastor, you don't understand. I've been dealing with this for years. Years I've been dealing with it. I know people in this room um, that have had illnesses that have gone on for years. Been to every doctor they can find and the illness isn't going away and it can seem like God doesn't care. But the reality is, whenever you're confused, remember the character of God. Can we say amen to that? He's a loving God, a gracious God, a merciful God. He'd rather die than live without you. He proved it on the cross of Calvary. And too often we allow the trials of life to focus on ourselves and think, well, God must not care. The Apostle Paul had a thorn in his flesh all his life. He prayed and asked God to remove it. God didn't remove it. And God may have left it to keep him humble. Maybe the same is for us. Can we say amen? 
Hey, I, you know, I don't like to talk about this. I've had a parasite since 1993 that puts me down all the time. But you know what? I've prayed about it. I've seen every specialist. God allows me to have it. If it's there to keep me humble and broken, then praise God for it. Amen? It's easy to say that. It's not always easy to pray that and to praise God for it. So let us stand firm, even as our trials endure. There's going to be a new governor, a new trial, same false accusations. Paul doesn't complain. We're going to see more specifically in the next chapter. He's going to have a chance to prophesy before a crowd and before a king. And you know what he's going to say? Praise God for the opportunity. If it took a few years in jail to be able to get up and preach the gospel in front of the king, to be able to have a new audience I can share the gospel with, then bring it on. Point number two. Lord, help us to walk in wisdom and to trust in God's promises. Do you know that Paul's going to use the uh, governmental opportunities that are available to him? I think we should do that. That it's okay for us to have wisdom as we also have faith. Can we say amen to that? So it's okay, I think, uh, you know, to, to call someone to task if they, when I was a youth pastor, I used to tell my youth group kids they couldn't bring their Bible to, ch- to school. And I'd say, well, that's absolutely not true. You absolutely can bring your Bible to school. Take your Bible to school anyway. Well, I'm going to get in trouble. Well, I know your dad will high five. You take your Bible to school anyway. Amen? And we can submit to the authorities that God's placed over us and use that for furtherance of the gospel. We're going to see Paul do that. He's going to plead to be brought before Caesar. Say, bring me, bring me to Caesar. Why? For him, it's another divine appointment. It's going to be another opportunity. And then thirdly, Lord, help us to see every situation through your eyes. May we recognize again the difference between divine punishment and divine appointment. So let's begin there in verse 1 of Acts 25. Remember that Paul has now been told that he's, gonna, he's been chained up and he's under house arrest. He is allowed to have visitors. People come to see him, but he's not free to come and go whenever he wants. And he's uh, in in Caesarea. When we do go to Israel, that amphitheater is still there where Paul is going to have mainly next week, Acts 26, where he preaches the gospel with boldness. The foundation of the house that he stayed in when he was there that's right on the sea. And so Paul's there and days and weeks and months and now a couple of years have gone by. And we don't see Paul murmuring. We don't see Paul complaining. We, see, we know that Paul's witnessing to, his, to the guys he's chained to. He's taking every opportunity for the gospel. So let's begin there in verse 1. Lord, help us to stand firm even as the trials endure. Now, when Festus had come to the province after three days, he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Felix, remember last week? He said, Felix said, I'll... I'll talk to you at a more convenient time. Two years go by, Felix is not going to be the governor anymore, and the more convenient time never came. Guys, this is why today is the day of salvation, amen? Because if we're going to put it off, uh, I don't understand why if you're laying there dying, you would put off the paramedic, amen? Come back next week if I'm still alive, you can help me out. And sometimes that's the reproach with the Lord. And Felix had said, you know, I'll I'll speak to you again at a more convenient time. And he did call for him several more times. But now two years have gone by. Felix is removed as governor. And now in comes a new governor. So Paul's lived there, had been available to Felix, only summoned him to try to extort money from him. If you remember last week, even after hearing the gospel, the only thing he said was, well, I was kind of hoping, I know you got some money. I was hoping you'd kind of bribe me so that uh, you could go free. But Nero appointed Festus as Felix's replacement. And we know from Josephus, he's a first century historian, not a Christian writer. But he represents him as an honorable and a capable leader who faced a set of insurmountable crises. So here's what happens. Festus is an honorable man from the world's perspective. And he comes in to take Felix's place. But at the same time, he's going to be a man whose oversight is over the Jews. And so as he comes into the land, what does he do? He's going to want to find favor with them. And he's coming in, he's going to meet for the first time the Apostle Paul. So the new governor went to Jerusalem to meet with the rulers of the Jews to introduce himself. And wanting to get to know and understand the people, he would be ruling over. This is what a good governor does. Go meet the people, find out what their concerns are. It's been two years, and guess what they're going to be concerned about? Paul. Two years later, he's been in chains, 
And when the governor comes to Jerusalem, Paul's 65 miles away. He's been banished to Caesarea. He's been under chains for two years. And when they come to him and say, I'm your new governor. I want to hear your concerns. There's this guy, Paul, we got to take care of. 65 miles away, he's been in chains for two years, and they haven't forgotten about him. And I have an idea because Paul's still not being quiet. Can we say amen to that? You may have me in chains, but the word of God is still going out. You cannot silence the word of God. You cannot quiet the Holy Spirit. Verse 2 and 3. Then the high priest and the chief men of the Jews informed him against Paul, and they petitioned him, asking favor against him, that he would summon him to Jerusalem while they lay in ambush along the road to kill him. They haven't even changed their plan. Do you remember last week, 40 men said, I'm not going to eat till that guy's dead? And I said, they better have had a big breakfast because God was not done with Paul yet. Amen? If God is for us, who can be against us? We're indestructible until God is through with us. Amen? Plot hasn't changed. Hey, can you summon him down here? We'll get some guys to ambush along the side of the road. We'll just wipe that dude out. We'll take care of your problem for you. Remember last time, they were plotting to kill Paul, and Paul's nephew heard it, went and told Paul, and they went and told the captain of the guard, and they had 470 armed guards escorting Paul. Guys, you plus God is a majority, amen? And God will even use things of the world to protect his followers if God chooses to do it that way. Knowing that no doubt with the recent Jew and Gentile rioting that had led to Felix's demise, Festus would want to have goodwill with the Jews. So when he heard this, his heart was, well, if that's what they want, let me see what I can do. I want them to be happy. I want, you know, I'm a new governor. It's the honeymoon period. I want us all to get along. What is it you need to make you happy? I don't even know who this guy is. That's fine. Let's, let's, you come on up there and we'll talk about this man and see if we can take care of this issue for you. So we'll look at verse 4 and 5. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept in Caesarea. Didn't say, well, I'm not going to bring him down here. I'm not going to make him travel this great distance. Um, they're so bitter toward Paul two years later, he's the only one they're talking about. All they want to do is kill him. And we know that Satan seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. But again, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So even though they have a plot to kill, he's going to turn the heart of Festus to, to instead give it another opportunity for the gospel. It says there in verse 4 and 5 again, But Festus answered that Paul should be kept in Caesarea, that he himself was going there shortly. Therefore, he said, Let those who have authority among you down, go down with me and accuse this man to see if there's any fault in him. Even though Festus wants to get the favor of the people that are following him, he also wants to do things the right way. So he's not going to summon him knowing that they're plotting to kill him. He instead is going to do it in the, the rightful way, a court of law in a sense. And he said, let's go down there. We'll examine him together. Two years later, he's still the only topic, seemingly the only topic of conversation. He's not going to honor their request, and I appreciate that part of Festus so far. Instead, he's inviting them back to Caesarea, verse 6. And when he had remained among them for more than 10 days, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, he commanded Paul to be brought. After two years of being incarcerated in protective custody, Festus is finally reopening his case. We don't have the background of what Paul does during this time. You know, we know God's using him, and we know that he could have been bitter and he could have been angry. But you know what? God was moving in Paul's heart and using Paul where he was, and he had something greater in store. Can I say for all of us in the midst of your trials that when you're in the middle of it, you never see. We don't get to see what God has coming next, but we need to learn that trust God knows what he's doing, and he's got something coming next, that he's going to use what you're going through now for his glory if you will let him. Amen? That this trial that I'm in right now that hurts so much and seems so difficult, uh, the, the situation I'm in that I don't have any answers to and I don't know where the answers are coming from, don't put your faith in your circumstances. Put your faith in the Savior. Amen? Let me ask you a question. Does God love you? Yes. Does He love you more than you can even fathom or understand? What's the answer? Yes. Did He die that you might have eternal life? 
Are you always on his mind? Is he praying for you right now? He's interceding on your behalf. Amen? Is that what the Word of God says? Guys, can we trust him? But then our circumstances come and how, how often do we forget? Amen? If God cared, he wouldn't let me go through this. And I love the Paul's example. Two years, no accusations yet, chained up unlawfully, and you don't hear a word of complaint because he trusts the sovereignty of God. You know what, guys? It's so easy to complain. I think as Christians, I, I'm be transparent. We all, anybody here complained this last week once? <laughs> besides me. And you know what? Complaining is wrong. I'm going to go as far as to say complaining is, is sin. Because do we trust God? If we're complaining, who are we complaining against? My boss is a jerk. Did God know he, he was going to be your boss? Pray for him. Amen? I'm being treated unfairly. Was our Savior treated unfairly? Amen? Guys, we need to learn to have a different perspective than the world does, to respond to trials different. And I love Paul's response. And so these guys are going to travel 65 miles again to bring accusations against Paul that didn't work the last time, but they're going to travel 65 more miles to stand in front of yet another judge, and Paul is being dragged back out, being accused of the very same things, but there's really no accusation. They're false accusations, but they're not going to stick. Paul's focus on eternity. He removes himself completely out of the equation. You know, to be humble is not to think little of yourself. It's not to think of yourself at all. Amen? It's not about me. It's about him. Not about me. Not about my comfort. It's not about what I want. It's about what he wills. Not my wants, but his will be done. Amen? Lord, if, you, if I have to go through illness that you're glorified, praise God. If I have to lose my job, praise God. Lord, I trust you. Heard someone on TV the other day say, well, you know, these Christians, they say you're supposed to love Jesus more than you love, like, even your own family. Amen. Can we say amen to that? You know why? Because if I love Jesus more than I love my wife, I'm going to love my wife an incredible amount. But seek first the kingdom of God. Make God the priority and the passion. He's more important than my job, than my health, than my future, than my stuff. He's it. It's about Him. For me to live as Christ and to die is gain. My life is Jesus. And to, to die is only to get better. Amen? Paul understood that. People say, well, we need to esteem ourselves more. Your problem is you don't have enough self-esteem. Knock that off. My problem is I esteem myself too much. How about you? Amen? I think about myself all the time. My three favorite people, me, myself, and I. Amen? How does this affect me? That's a great picture because I look good. It's a horrible picture because I don't. Amen? We have this mentality and people say, well, you need to esteem yourself. No, the Bible says to deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow Him. Amen? And the problem in the church today is we have a problem dying to ourselves. We want to, we want to be comfortable. We want to be... We want to be uh, the light shining on us is to him be the glory. And Paul was willing to say, I'll sit here in chains. I'll sit here if this is where the Lord wants me to be. To him be the glory. He knows where I am. I'm praying. I'm trusting him. I'm waiting for the next divine appointment. And when he brings it, Lord, help me to be ready. That's Paul's heart. Lord, help that to be our heart as well. Audience before the Sanhedrin already. He had an audience before Felix, now he's going to have another audience, verse 7. When they had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and laid many serious complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. Has anybody ever falsely accused you? Is that not aggravating? When someone says something about you that's not true, i got enough things you could say about me that are true, Amen. There's enough things people could point at that are true about us. And so when someone says something that's not even true, it's hard not to want to fight back. It's so hard to just bite your tongue. It says of our Savior, like a lamb led to slaughter, he opened not his mouth. Jesus, the perfect lamb of God, could have defended himself. He could have stopped it all. He could have turned everyone into a pile of rocks that was touching him. He could have smoked the guy that was scourging him. And you know why he endured it all? Because without the cross of Calvary, you and I can't go to heaven. That's why he endured it. He endured it because he loves you. 
Amen? So Lord, help us to endure because we love you. Amen? Because it's through the enduring through the trials that we grow spiritually and that God is glorified. And Paul, same false accusation, but they can't prove anything. They're making stuff up. Verse 8. While he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I offended in anything at all. Paul had been silent until he was given an opportunity to speak. And all he does is says, I have not broken the law of the Jews, of the Romans, or of the temple. All the things they're accusing me of, I have not done. There is no proof. He's not jumping up and down. He's not yelling and screaming. He's not angry. He's not, uh, you know, trying to stir up his followers to come and riot. He's just standing up and saying the truth. And by the way, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Amen. So we don't respond in anger or in arrogance or in self-righteousness, but in humility. And that's how Paul responds. Verse 9. But Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? Paul could have gone to Jerusalem. But didn't the Lord tell him that he was going to go to Rome? What's the answer? He said, Paul, you're going to go to Rome and you're going to testify to me of me in Rome. The Lord's already shown him that. Going back to Jerusalem, he could have just said, whatever you want me to do. But Paul's actually going to, to use what God has put on his heart, the calling on his life. And then he's going to use what the law says. And he's going to use wisdom to bring about what God has put upon his heart to do. Sometimes people will say, well, Christians, um, you know, we got to stand up for ourselves. Well, no, we don't. But then they'll say, well, then you're just going to let everybody run over the top of you. Well, we don't do that either. What we do instead is we allow God to be the one to defend us. Amen? Let God defend us. And it's okay to say, well, no, I can bring my Bible to school. Yeah, no, I can. And yes, I can stand up for the Lord. And yes, I can share my faith during my lunch hour. And yes, the, you know, and I can stand up for that. Don't be a jerk. Don't be self-righteous. But you can stand up for it. You can seek wisdom. And we're going to see Paul do just that. So he's being asked, do you want to go back to Jerusalem to be put on trial? I've already witnessed to that mob. I'm looking for a new mob to witness to. Amen? I already talked to those people about the Lord. Give me another opportunity. There's another place that God wants me to go. And I'm going to be going to Rome. So Festus, responding like the politician that he was, was more concerned with his approval rating before men than in covering the truth. And he asked Paul if he'd be willing to be judged before the Jewish Sanhedrin, the same group who had falsely accused Paul and sought to kill him two years earlier. Also, did, weren't they going to lay in wait for him on the road to Jerusalem? Is God going to protect him? What's the answer? Of course he is. So the first thing we see is, Lord, help us to stand firm even when our trials endure. Two years of the same thing, two years of no accusations, two years, and Paul doesn't change. Do you know that people are going to see your faith in action in the greatest way when you're in the midst of the greatest trials? It's easy to be the Christian on the cruise ship to heaven, but how do you respond in the times of great difficulty? People that you share your faith with, people at work and neighbors and family members that know you're a Christian, they may not listen to your words, but they're going to watch your actions. And when you're in that great difficulty and trial and your faith remains steadfast, that's going to speak volumes. Because guys, we trust in the sovereignty of our God. And he's greater than any circumstance I may go through. And that's what Paul's done for two years. So now they're saying to him, so Paul has to answer. Are you willing to go back to Jerusalem? Point number two, Lord, help us to walk in wisdom and to trust in your promises. God had promised he'd go to Rome. That he's going to have an, another great audience to speak the gospel to. So instead of acquiescing and going back to Jerusalem, here's what he says in verse 10. So Paul said... I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews, I have done no wrong, as you very well know. Is he making a stand here? You already know that I've done them no wrong. I stand before the seat of Caesar, which is where I belong. I don't belong going back 
Because, again, God's protecting him. More marauders on the road. The first time God protected him by sending 470 soldiers to accompany him, this time the Holy Spirit moves on his heart not to even go back. God can protect us both ways by the move of the Holy Spirit and by the hands of men that he has come alongside of us. That's our God. Amen? And that's exactly what happens here. And he says, I'm standing before the seat of Caesar. The appropriate only place a Roman like Paul could be fairly judged. Verse 11 and 12. For if I am an offender or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. Now I love this. Paul is not afraid of death. Death has no sting for the Christian. Can we say amen to that? Death has no sting. Death is graduation day. I'm going to close my eyes on earth and I'm going to open them up in glory. You can't threaten me with heaven. Amen? And with that kind of a heart, Paul says, I'm not afraid to die. But his willingness to not be afraid to die does not mean that he's going to live recklessly. Even though you don't fear death, doesn't mean you don't go play on the freeway. Amen? He's still going to use godly wisdom. He still wants to live his life sold out for the Lord. He doesn't fear death, but he's not going to live in a reckless way. He wants to honor God. He wants to be faithful to God's calling upon his life. And so, look, I'm not afraid of dying. You can't threaten me with heaven. But then he says this. But... If there is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. Once again, he says, look, you're not going to turn me over to the religious and lost who cried out for the crucifixion of their Messiah because they didn't recognize him, who now only seek my death. I'm not afraid of dying, but you know what? God's not done with me here yet, and I'm going to take the legal rights that I have, and I appeal to Caesar. You send me in front of Caesar, and I'll preach the gospel there. I'll stand before the seat of Caesar. I'll stand right here. When we get, if you're back next week, you're going to see Paul preach an amazing message to an amphitheater filled with people, filled with a lot of royal, a lot of people who would have never had a chance to share the gospel with had he not been arrested and falsely accused. And praise God for opportunities that God gives us because of our trials. I shared with you many times that I had a coworker, uh, Jehan Jehansus, JJ, we called her, uh, born Muslim, born in Iran. Uh, and she used to mock my faith mercilessly. And I had a Bible study at work, and she would call us the God Squad, not in a kind way. And as the Bible study grew, she'd open the door sometime and mock us, say, say a prayer to the Easter Bunny for me while you're at it, and just, just mock our faith. I had gone away from work for a while and come back to work, and on my first day back, she wore a T-shirt and said, born right the first time. You know, mocking being born again. And you know what? I witnessed to her, I loved on her, I did everything, and man, she was so hard. And it was me going through the coma and being sick and all the things that I went through and then coming back to work that God used to soften that woman's heart. She ended up coming to Calvary Chapel Santa Cruz. She ended up giving her life to Jesus Christ. She came down here to to Malibu so I could baptize her in the ocean in one of our, and now she's in church every week and sending me Bible verses all the time. So praise God, it's worth, is it worth being in the hospital and in a coma for a while to see the hard-hearted Muslim get saved? What's the answer? Is it worth whatever trial we have to go through? See guys, trials are not wasted. No suffering is wasted for the believer. God will use it for his glory if we will let him. Amen? And so the point is that in all of our lives, many of you have been through 10 times worse than what I've been through. And remember that God loves you. And if he allows it into your life, he will use it for his glory if you will let him. Paul is still going to appeal to Caesar. He's been through this trial. Here comes another audience. He's using wisdom that he's getting from the Lord. He's remembering God's promise that he was going to go to Rome. I'm not going to go back there. I've already dealt with those people. I've already witnessed to them. I'm going to stay right here. He's making a stand for the truth and making a stand for the gospel. Verse 12. Then Festus who had conferred with the council, answered and said, you've appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you'll go. So is it okay to stand up for the things of God in front of the courts? What's the answer? What's the answer? 
Is it okay to say, no, that's not right. No, we're going to stand for it. Now, Christians, we, we don't need to uh, overly defend ourselves and leave that in God's hands, but we don't need to let the world tell us it's against the law to preach the gospel when it's not. Amen? We live in a world right now where us being too silent sometimes has getting our, our freedoms taken away from us. But here's the reality. You cannot quiet the Holy Spirit. You cannot shut down the Word of God. God's Word will endure forever. And those who judge over it, they're the ones on trial, not the people preaching the gospel. Amen? Amen? It's not Paul on trial here. It's going to be Festus. It's going to be Bernice we're going to see here in a minute here in Agrippa. It's going to be others that come into his life, and he's not on trial. They are. It's not, it's not the Christians that are on trial at work. It's the unbelievers in the office that need to come to know Christ. And Lord, help us to be loving and kind and gracious and to stand up and speak the truth, love people enough to tell them what they don't want to hear. In Acts 23, it said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness in Rome. Caesarea of Palestine, right of every Roman to a fair trial. He cried out for it, and now he's going to get it. I want a fair trial. I want to stand before Caesar. But really what it's going to be is an opportunity for the gospel. And praise God for that. I'm thankful for people that make stands for the gospel in front of the Supreme Court. Can we say amen to that? People that challenge things like abortion. Praise God for that. You know, we don't just sit back and, and we want to stand for the truth and we don't want to be violent. We don't want to be th those people, but we want to stand for the truth. And that's what Paul's doing in a sense. He's going to be faithful to move in obedience to God's promise and may we all learn to put God's will above our own desires. He's like, look, he had a heart for the, the, the Jews. And going to back to Jerusalem, no doubt, could have been part of his heart to go back and minister to his people. He'd had such a burden for it. He'd been wanting to go to Jerusalem for years. He finally was there. Now he has a chance to go back, but he knows that God told him, I'm sending you to Rome. So he's going to obey God rather than his own desires. Praise God for that. Again, easier said than done. God's not done with Paul. He's got a divine appointment for him. And as we walk in obedience to God's word, we'll be blessed and God will be glorified. And on the other side of obedience, divine appointments wait. I really believe that. As we obey God, I believe divine appointments wait for us. As we walk in obedience to the Lord, as we seek after His face, as we make Him the priority, I believe that there's more and more divine appointments waiting on the other side of our obedience to God. Without this trial, this divine appointment would not have existed. Again, you'll have to come back next Sunday, but when we get to chapter 26, we're going to see how God's going to use all that Paul's been through to bring the gospel to a massive crowd that would maybe have never heard it otherwise. And praise God for that. By the way, just in a side note, Philadelphia Eagles won the Super Bowl. And man, do they have a lot of Christians on that team. And everybody asks them anything. It's Jesus, 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 Jesus. Then a video came out of them baptizing guys in the swimming pool two weeks before the Super Bowl. And all this stuff, and they're using it for the kingdom of God and for His glory. And you know what, whatever, the things that we think in life that we think it's about, it's not really about that necessarily. It's about pointing people to Jesus, because what's more important than winning a stupid trophy that everybody's going to forget about in a year anyway? The kingdom of God and people's lives being changed, amen? And so the trials that we go through that we think are so overwhelming, the reality is they're nothing when compared to eternity. And praise God for the opportunity he gives us. Finally, Lord, help us to see every situation through your eyes. May we recognize the difference between divine punishment and divine appointments. I will say this, in the prayer requests, and praise God for them, and I even want to share with you and other people. Some people will say, well, I just feel like God doesn't care. I've been praying about this a long time. You know, the Bible says a day is to a thousand years as a thousand years is to a day. Amen? What may seem like a long time to you is nothing compared to eternity. And even if you've been praying for years, I'm not downplaying how difficult some of your trials are, but rest assured that God knows and he loves you and he's faithful. And may we see it through his eyes, not ours. Amen? Look what it says here in verse 13. After some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. King Agrippa, a man of perverse and wicked inheritance. He's the son of Herod Agrippa. Remember we talked about the Herods last week. Well, here we go. Here's the last of the Herods. Remember who the Herods are. 
Uh, Herod Agrippa was eaten by worms because they, you know, voice of a God, not a man. He was receiving all the praise and he was eaten by worms. He had killed James. He had imprisoned Peter. His uncle Herod had beheaded John the Baptist. His grandfather killed all the babies in an attempt to kill Jesus. And as evil and wicked as a family as there ever was on this planet. The Herods. And this is another one. And he comes to greet Festus. And... This Herod's sister was the wife of Felix. Remember Drusilla from last week? So Drusilla was married to his brother. Her sister was married to Felix and had rejected the gospel. Remember last time she was there questioning Paul and they were not persuaded. And as we know from history, a few years later, Mount Vesuvius, she was killed while shopping. Probably should have given your life to Jesus, amen? And so now this is that same family. Here comes some more people to examine Paul. But who's really on trial here? They are. They're coming to examine Paul, but they're the ones who are being examined. When, come, when people come to press us on our faith, it's not us on trial. It's not the Word of God on trial. It's the people coming. And praise God for the opportunity to share with them. I love those opportunities to tell people about Jesus. It says there, and Bernice. So Bernice is described in literature as a ravishing beauty. She's, again, the, she's the half-sister of her husband. So she's already been married a couple times, she's been married a couple times, now she's shocking up with her brother. What a wonderful family the Herods are. They, they would probably have a, uh, a reality show now with high ratings. <laughs> Can we say amen to that? Everybody getting pregnant by people that are related to, it's a train wreck. And now people watch that and glorify it and go shopping at their store in Calabasas. Now Agrippa, <laughs> Agrippa and Bernice are living in sin. And history tells us that Bernice, who had been married twice before, left Agrippa for a Roman general and after a brief marriage to this king, returns to a king, returns back to Agrippa. And so this Agrippa II was powerful, greatly, his power had been greatly diminished, his rule limited to the northern area of Israel, north of the Sea of Galilee. He's more of a figurehead than a, a potent political figure. He calls on Festus to strengthen his political ties and then when he gets there, there's a divine appointment waiting for him with the Apostle Paul. These two extremely immoral and godless people think they're going to examine Paul, but it's the two of them that will be examined by the gospel. Verse 14, when they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, there is a certain man left a prisoner by Felix, about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem, asking for a judgment against him. So Festus lays Paul's case out before King Agrippa, and because it was embarrassing enough to have to first cast an appeal to Caesar, far worse was that they had no accusations. He's like, you know, I, I looked at the guy's case, I got nothing. And I got to send him to Caesar, and when we get him there, we're going to say, why is he here? We have no idea. Can you imagine being brought into, you know, you bring a guy in chained up, you slam his head on the table in front of the Supreme Court. What's the charges? We don't have any. <laughs> this is where they are. They've got nothing. They're holding Paul. They're chaining Paul. They're accusing Paul. They have no accusations. He calls the king in. He's going to say, dude, can you help me find something? Because he's appealed to Caesar. If I just let him go, the Jews are going to be mad at me. He wants to go to Caesar. But if I send him to Caesar with no accusations, I'm going to look like an idiot. And I'm the new governor here. Hey, king, can, you, can we check this guy out and see if we can find something to accuse him of? Reminds me of Daniel that the only accusation they could find against him was in his relationship with God. Remember that? You know, what did they outlaw to finally catch Daniel? They outlawed prayer. The only way we're going to catch this guy, we better out, I don't know, let's outlaw prayer. That'll get him. Because that guy prays all the time. They couldn't outlaw anything else because you know what? He was a faithful man of God. And I feel like here's the same thing with Paul. No accusation. He wasn't sinless, we're all sinners, but he was without accusation. He had not broken the law. He was not a criminal. And so they're 
trying to put their heads together. The chief priests and the elders wanted to bring swift judgment against Paul and Festus wanting to earn their goodwill. He knew that when he sent him up there, I could have an accusation. I got nothing. All the stuff they told me amounts to nothing. And yet, he's on trial. You know, on a trial, every side must be heard. And defendant must hear the accusation and have an opportunity to defend himself. They don't even have an accusation against him. Look at verse 17. Therefore, they had come together without any delay. And the next day, I said in the judgment seat, and commanded the man to be brought in. So I, I can't send him to the Romans. He said, it's not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction. Verse 16, before the uh, accused meets the accuser face to face. So I brought him in. They're meeting the accuser face to face. I said, tell me what he's done. Verse 17, they begin to tell him what they think he's done. Verse 18, and when the accusers stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such things as I supposed but had some questions against them concerning their own religion and about a certain Jesus who had died, who Paul affirmed to be alive. So why is Paul really on trial? For preaching the resurrection. Amen? Hey, if I'm going to be in front of the Supreme Court, let that be the charge. Amen? He said, you know, According to Roman law, he's got to be able to defend himself, but he can't defend himself till the accusations are brought. Then I brought all the people in. I couldn't find any accusations. The only one I could find is, really was something about their own religion, not our law. And it was because they said that this man, Jesus, had died, but he says he's alive. There's the accusation. He's saying that Jesus is alive. That's not a crime. That's a commandment to go therefore into all the world and to preach the gospel. Amen? To preach Jesus Christ died on the cross and risen from the dead. Amen? And he's preaching the whole gospel. And that's what they've outlawed. Guys, if they outlaw the gospel and I go to jail for that or you go to jail for that, praise God. Amen? Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you for my name's sake. For so they did the prophets that went before you. So since it's a religious question, I wanted him to go to Jerusalem. Look, it says in verse 20. Verse 20 and because I was certain of such, uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he would be willing to go to Jerusalem and be judged concerning these matters. Do you want to go be judged by the guys who are accusing you? Because that's what he's asking them. Do you want to go back to Jerusalem and let the religious leaders judge you? No. I've already been there. I've already shared the gospel with them. I don't have a heart to go back to there. Verse 21. But when Paul appealed to be reserved for decision of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept until I could send him to Caesar. When Paul appeared to be brought before Caesar, Festus commanded him to be protected until he could be delivered for trial. So Paul makes a stand for the Lord and he gets put right back where he was. And he's going to wait some more. Now King Agrippa is going to come. You know, the Lord had promised him before that you will testify before men and before kings. Is that not about to happen? It's about to happen. Divine appointments come when we make stands for the Lord and we obey Him. When we say, Lord, here I am, use me. God's not looking for better, a better message or a better method. He's just looking for men and women who will say, Lord, I'm here. Will you use me for your glory? Lord, please. Lord, I'm here. The eyes of the Lord search to and fro among the whole earth, seeking one who can show himself strong on account of one whose heart is loyal to him. He's looking for men and women who will just be available. Lord, I'm available. Use me. I'll lay down my life for you. I surrender it fully to you. Verse 22. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So Agrippa wants to hear what Paul had to say with his own ears. Festus needed help to establish charges against Paul before he sends him to Caesar. Great, you can hear him tomorrow. Maybe you can come up with something. We've got to figure out a way to send this guy to Caesar. We've got to find an accusation against him. And yet again, it's not going to be Paul on trial. It's going to be Agrippa. He wants to hear Paul. And he needs to hear Paul. He needs to hear the truth. Verse 23. So the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp. I love that. They come walking in, da, 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 right, pomp, circumstance, playing music, feathers in the sky, waving stuff, right? They come in, the music, everybody's playing, and they, they're all dressed to the nines, and they come walking in, and everybody's, oh, you're so amazing. 
And they come in and they're all going to sit down. Everybody's going, whoa, we're in their presence. I can't even believe it. Let's get the auto- can get King Agrippa's autograph. You know, this mentality that we have in the world today. We praise people of position. Oh, I saw that person on a screen in my living room. Oh, they must be amazing. People tell them what words to say. They go say them. And then they say them the way that we said we told them to say it. And so now they must be amazing. I need their autograph on a piece of paper. This pomp, this, uh, this admiration of men. And you know what? Oh, you're the king of Oh, wow, you're amazing. And so he comes into this crowd, and, and we're going to see next week that the amphitheater is filled with people, and they're all there, and the, the pomp and the circumstance and all the praise for men. And what's really happening is a divine appointment with the gospel. And too often we can fall into the trap of looking at men and making them praiseworthy when there's only one worthy to be worshipped and to be praised. Amen? We don't praise men, we praise God. And you know what? We don't praise godly men and women, we praise God. Amen? We don't praise position, we, don't pra- we honor, we have respect for positions of authority over us, but we don't worship them, we worship God. So they come in and they're filled with themselves and everybody's blessed to be in my presence. And then it says there, they came with great pomp and when they had entered the auditorium with the commanders of the prominent men of the city at Festus' command, Paul was brought in. So you can just see this crowd and they're seated there and everybody's all dressed to the nines and all the pomp and everything that's going on and Paul's going to come in in chains. He's going to be standing in front of this amphitheater filled with people and these royal people all dressed to the nines who came in with great pomp and celebration. And here out comes Paul, this man in chains, standing before them. And they think they're going to examine Paul. And they think they're going to put Paul on trial. And the truth is, everybody in that amphitheater is about to hear the gospel. And every one of them will be held accountable for the gospel that's going to be shared by Paul. See, often we think that the world looks at us and wants to put us on trial. They want to put Christianity on trial. And the reality is, it's the world that's on trial, not our Savior. Amen? So here he is. He's standing in front of this crowd. Uh, Agrippa and Bernice focus on fleshly desires that are desired to be seen by men, to be honored. They come in arrogantly into the auditorium and they bring out Paul in his humility and which is the one that's truly serving the Lord. And Festus said, verse 24, King Agrippa, And all the men who are here present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. The Jews were saying, kill him! Kill this guy! Why? Because he says Jesus is alive. That blows our gig. If Jesus is alive, then I'm not the high priest anymore. He is. If Jesus is alive, then the People aren't going to come to synagogue anymore because they don't need to. They're not going to observe the feast. I'm not going to be able to rip people off when they come to bring their lambs in to be sacrificed and charge them five times the price. This is a, a threat against my way of life. Silence that man who preaches the truth. Now, they don't believe it's the truth. They believe he's preaching a false gospel. So they cry out. And they didn't want to live any longer. Last couple of verses. But when I found that he had committed nothing deserving of death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him. Verse 26. I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore, I have brought him out before you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so you, after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. Agrippa, I'm bringing him out so you can check check him out and give me something I can write down to accuse this guy of because I got nothing right now. He's been in chains for years. He's been brought before the Sanhedrin. He's been brought before Felix. He's been brought before the religious leaders. He's been brought before other, other govern, governors and all these people. And every, nobody can find any fault in him. Who does that sound like? It's Jesus. And Paul's following in the footsteps of his Savior. And Paul's not afraid to die. And because he's not afraid to die, he's not afraid to, afraid to speak the truth with boldness. Amen? Guys, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Can't threaten us with heaven. So, King Agrippa, could you help a brother out here? I got nothing. I need to find out what's wrong with this guy. Can you, t- can you and your, your half-sister you're shacking up with, check him out and let me know 
what you can have me accuse him of doing. Last verse. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner to not specify the charges against him. Amen to that. <laughs> seems kind of stupid to send a guy up there who hadn't done nothing. But I need some help here. So now Paul's going to respond. And he's going to, standing there in chains, addressing this huge crowd, this amphitheater that's still there to this day. I've been there. I've stood in the spot where Paul would be standing. And all these people with all their arrogance and their pomp and their circumstance. And here's, here's Paul, this meager man, chained up. And he's about to preach the gospel with boldness. And so the next verse would be, you've got to come back next Sunday. <laughs> because now we're going to hear Paul's response to all these false accusations. We're gonna hear Paul's response to being enslaved when he didn't, you know, chained up for no reason. We're gonna see Paul's response to having to go through a great trial that he didn't deserve. And we're gonna see that Paul counts it all joy because he recognizes that everything in his life is not about him, but it's about the Lord. It's not about my comfort, it's about his glory. And if I need to be chained up for a few years to stand in front of this crowd that needs to hear about Jesus, then it was all worth it. Can we say amen to that? So count it all joy. Learning to see our trials not as God forsaking us, but as an opportunity for the gospel and to grow spiritually. Number one, Lord, help us to stand firm even as the trials endure. I know in this room there's been people dealing with health trials, financial trials, uh, kids that are away from the Lord, all kinds of difficulties of life. I want you to be encouraged. I'm not downplaying that your trial doesn't exist because it does. I'm not saying it's not difficult because it is. But you need to know that God is faithful and he loves you and you're not alone. Amen? And we pray in our time and God answers in his time. Number two, Lord, help us to walk in wisdom and to trust his promises. We can use wisdom in responding to people. We're not just Christian doormats. We don't just, right? But at the same time, we walk in humility and we can use wisdom and we can trust in the promises of God. We need to trust in the promises of God. And then finally, Lord, help us to see every situation through your eyes. You know, the only reason that Paul is responding the way that he is is God has given him such an eternal perspective that he sees everything as an opportunity for the gospel. And he's willing to suffer whatever it takes that God might be glorified. Let me ask a question, are we, are we willing to, to endure any kind of discomfort? Are we willing to go through trials of life that God might be glorified? Is it worth it? Or do we just want to be that comfortable Christian on the cruise ship to heaven who goes to church once in a while, checks our faith at the door when we leave church and live in like the world? Lord, help us. Amen? May we learn from Paul's example that trials in the Christian life are not acts of divine punishment, but again, are an opportunity for us to grow spiritually and to point people to Christ. James chapter 1, let me close with this. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the examples we see. And Lord, we thank you that we have the same Holy Spirit living inside of us that dwell within, dwells within the Apostle Paul. Lord, give us a heart to see the world through your eyes, to love people the way you love them, to be unashamed of the gospel, to speak the truth in love, even if it costs us something in the temporal. Lord, I pray for those who are going through great trials right now, and I know many are. Lord, may you comfort them and strengthen them. May they know that you're not, they're not alone, that you're a faithful God. You already see what's next. Lord, help all of us in the midst of trials to trust you, not to murmur, not to complain, not to doubt, but to rest in you and your faithfulness and your character and in your promises. Amen. Lord, we pray for divine appointments this coming week. Lord, even through the midst of our trials, use those as opportunities to respond in a way that glorifies you, not to be like the world, murmuring and complaining and doubting, but trusting in spite of everything going on around us. So Lord, we do. We love you and we praise you. Lord, give us opportunities to stand up for you. Lord, be glorified in our lives. Less of us, more of you. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Let's stand up and worship.